Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, creatives from around the world. Hello, Internet. Hello, everyone. NAB Day 3 here at the Max on Booth. I'm Matthias, a.k.a. Major VFX on all the social medias. And I'm accompanied by amazing artists throughout the day, throughout the entire show. And for those of you who don't know, we stream live on 3D Motion Show. And for those of you who are there, make sure to go to 3dmotionshow.com, click sign up, and we will definitely keep you informed of all the happenings, all the live events, all the different training events, and there's so much going on. And I would have to say, I'm super excited for this next presentation. We've recently joined forces. ZBrush is part of the Maxon family. And now I get access to amazing presenters like this amazing artist to my left, Anna Carolina. Please give a big round of applause for Anna Carolina. Hey, everybody. Testing. Sounds good? So uh, thank you so much for having me, first of all. My name is Anna Carolina Pereira. I am a 3D technical artist and um, character artist. My specialties are virtual reality development and game art. So this, I'm a little bit out of my element here in the motion graphics uh, world. But um, today I would like to talk to you about how to use ZBrush in your workflow in order to work faster. Not just using ZBrush, but also cleverly using some tools in order to um, be able to iterate extremely fast and produce extremely fast, especially when you are creating multiple designs for your clients and things like that. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. As a technical artist, I'm always trying to think of ways to move really fast throughout production, working on workflows and kind of keeping in mind like where our time is being spent. So I've worked on a few uh, techniques for ZBrush, especially because I also stream for ZBrush Live uh, officially with Maxon, and we have to move really fast when we are streaming. I've, I'm using my uh, expertise as a teacher today and kind of focusing on certain questions that I get from my students all the time of things they struggle with when they are using these tools to move a little faster. There's a lot of little pitfalls that you can get stuck in when you're working. <laughs> So the first thing I would like to do is today we're going to be kind of creating this little alien creature right here using multiple tricks and, and uh, tips and tricks, I guess, to get on with it. So let's start with the sphere in order to block it out. I think part of what makes ZBrush special is that you can kind of, to a degree, disregard topology for a long time. So you're not uh, bound by it. I'm going to use this brush called the snake hook brush. That gives you a lot of control and a lot of power in your mesh. It basically just follows your brush as much as you want. And you can tell that as I'm kind of pulling around, I'm stretching my topology completely. This is something that we try to avoid as 3D artists, right? Especially because it would render very nicely. So what I can do is I can turn on this S button up here to turn on Sculptures Pro mode in order to have ZBrush automatically recreate my topology to give me a lot of flexibility. If I turn on my polyframe mode to see the topology, you can actually see that we started off with mostly uh, quads, but as I go, they update real time. So I'm going to use this brush to kind of start blocking out a little alien being. With symmetry turned on, I always make sure to check the little head up at the corner to make sure I'm facing the right direction. And I'm just going to kind of block out the little face using my little scope just to tool. I'm going to go to masking and I'm going to choose Mask Lasso in order to kind of mask out the area where I want the neck to be. I'm going to invert my mask and just kind of pull out the neck. Work on the shoulders. <laughs> Still getting used to the setup. Made it a little wide, so I'm just going to reduce it a little bit. You can smooth it, start to think about the chest a little bit. And once I've got somewhat of a base, I'm going to switch to a tool that I like using better for more control, which is the move brush. Little by little, fleshing out our little alien being. 
Aliens are really cool because they can look like just about anything. I'm going to turn off polyframe mode so I don't get distracted by all the colors and the lines. I'm just kind of fleshing it out bit by bit. Kind of creating a little space for the eyes, smoothing out. As I'm smoothing, I, I can notice that I have polyframe, I have um, Sculptures Pro turned on. So as I'm smoothing, I'm adding topology. It kind of adapts based on your brush size. So if I make my brush smaller, I'll actually get more topology. If I make it bigger, I'll take off. So I'm going to take some off. I like to work really low poly when I'm starting. And I'm going to take off Sculptures Pro mode. Use a little bit of the clay brushes that they have to kind of start creating a little bit of uh, a shadow of anatomy, so to speak. Get that jawline in there. And so on. I'm going to go ahead and turn sculptures back on and add some topology. One area that my students are always and uh, always, always struggling with is um, the eyes. The eyelids are specifically tricky to make and the mouth as well. You guys know that in order to, for us to be able to animate the mouth and animate uh, speech and things like that, we actually need to have a full-on mouth cavity that's been built out in your model. So a lot of artists struggle with this. They ask me, uh, do I do it now when I'm blocking out? Do I do it when I'm done? I highly don't recommend it doing it when you're done because otherwise you're going to destroy a lot of the hard work you've done all over the face. right? So I've, I've come up with a neat, I think it's a neat trick of creating the mouth cavity which is to just use live booleans. And that gives you an extreme amount of control to be able to create uh, everything that you need inside the mouth without having to like stretch out your, your mesh. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn on live boolean. And this is one of the coolest things ever. I love playing around with live boolean. I'm going to go ahead and click append, choose a sphere, grab that sphere, make it a little smaller, <laughs> about mouth sized. This is one of those cases where you really need to trust the process. I'm going to go ahead and solo it out temporarily so I can kind of get more of a, what I would expect. Oh, I should turn symmetry on by pressing X. And just kind of shape it out. I just don't, don't want the front to be too big. This is where the lips will be. Just trust the process. I'm going to turn it off, solo mode, reposition as necessary. And then I'm going to go right here. In each subtool, you can select how it uh, performs with Booleans. If I turn on exclusionary mode, you can see that I can now create kind of the mouth cavity using this mesh. It will kind of continue to uh, keep the mesh that you have original um, from being too distorted by this process. So just kind of choose the size of the, of the mouth you'd like. Make sure to smooth it. And the cool part is that you can keep sculpting on the object that you're currently working with as necessary to get the look you want. So I'm going to use a little bit of the standards. Let's create a little bit of that. I know it looks a little funky. <laughs> hey, little mouth. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right. So this is going to help a lot. And those of you who have used ZBrush before know that this process can be tragic, tragic to your model. It can destroy everything. So get it done early and get it done like this will help a lot. It's a little bit, we're kind of losing a lot of uh, volume here. So I'm going to try to just deform the mesh a little bit around those areas. I'm not going to spend too much time refining it, of course, because I only have 50 minutes. 40 now. OK. Then we can do the same thing for the eyelids. I'm going to go ahead and append a sphere. And this one, I will create the outer part of the eyelids. So I'm going to leave it as like additive, not subtractive. <laughs> Looks like I squished it. No, I didn't. Like that. That would be the outer part of the eyelid. Then I'm going to go ahead and append a cylinder. And this will be the actual opening of the eyelid itself. So I'm going to rotate it. If you press down shift and drag, you can um, kind of snap it. I'm going to make it smaller, plan it all out. Well, I can still see it, of course. 
then kind of overlap it with that. I'm going to turn on subtractive mode and start to kind of get a preview of what that looks like. Like that. You'll see that we kind of get this like big old kind of hole effect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate the original circle, make it a little bit smaller, and then turn exclusionary mode on here. So now we kind of have the shape of the eyelid as it would be uh, from the inside. I probably need to turn it shaped a little bit like that. If I get any issues like that, I can just take my move brush and just kind of push back that area for now. Plus, nobody will see that because it's going to be like way inside of the uh, eye cavity. Looks a little funky, right? <laughs> it's OK. What we're going to do next is we're going to create the Boolean. We're going to zero mesh it. Everything's going to be OK in the end. Just trust me. So I'm going to go ahead and select Boolean, make Boolean mesh. And what that's going to do is it's going to create a brand new mesh for me. Where is it? There it is, a brand new mesh. When I look at the polyframe, I can tell that they've actually been welded together, like you would expect with a normal Boolean. If I, if I smooth it, you'll see that it's together now. Before I do anything else, I'm going to go ahead and mirror this so that I can get the eye on the other side. So I'm going to go to Geometry, Modify Topology, Mirror and Weld. Gets me kind of a funky line down the center. Let me turn off my, my Sculptures Pro. I'm just going to smooth it down the center a little bit. I don't really care about that line because I'm about to zero mesh it. Before I zero mesh it, I'm going to press Control and Shift and isolate the outer group. These different colors you're seeing here, if you don't know, are Z groups, or I'm sorry, poly groups. They are basically putting different polygons of the mesh into different little groups so that you can easily select them or do operations to them. It doesn't actually affect the outcome of the mesh, say, if I were to export this to a different program. So I'm going to control shift select to isolate this poly group. And one thing I'm going to do ahead of time is mask out the lower part of the jaw and control W to create our own poly group for here. What this will do is it will allow us for us to deformate the jaw, kind of close the mouth without kind of losing any, any progress, so to speak. Um, if you don't do this ahead of time and you're sculpting a mesh and you close the mouth, getting it open again will be a total nightmare. You basically, the only solution for that is to destroy the lips and then start again. So I'm going to go ahead and zero mesh this. I'm going to choose a little bit higher topology just because I know it's going to destroy it. And one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on symmetry in order to get perfectly symmetrical topology across both sides. What that will do is allow me to use a bunch of other cool features in the future. Zero measure. Hold your breath. Oh, I forgot a step. See how all of the polygroups are gone? I'm going to undo that and say keep groups. Zero mesh again. And what that will do is it'll create perfect polygon loops around those uh, edges of the groups, and it's also going to keep my groups so that I can use them later. Very, very important step. Topology is not perfect, but having topology that even somewhat flows with the creases of the face is going to help you a lot in the sculpting process, and it's going to not hinder you in the sculpting process, which is the whole point. From here, what I'll do is just kind of close the mouth really fast, invert that mask. Gorgeous. This thing does not have proper anatomy. It's OK. So close the mouth. But it's very friendly, which is nice. Smooth out that rest. And while you're working in this like low poly method, you can get away with like you know giving it a big old smooth, because it doesn't matter. We're not really losing any details right now. Once you close the mouth, you can, you know, it's not properly closed. Let me try again. <laughs> then we can block out whatever we want, lips, things like that. And add a little volume. And the cool thing is that no matter what happens from here, I can always kind of select the top lips or bottom lips and move them around accordingly as I wish. This helps a lot give her a little nose. All right, moving on. So the next trick, 
is I've, I've kind of fleshed out ahead of time. I used mostly just move, uh, move brush, clay buildup, and Damien Standard to create these shapes of the face. But everything I've done to this one is exactly what I've shown you so far. I want to show you guys how to do some really cool instanced meshes uh, to make some horns for this creature. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to append a cylinder, which will be the kind of the individual base part of the horn. I'm going to make it a little smaller, put it up here. And I'm going to uh, basically array this a bunch of times so that I can uh, create a nice horn. I've already done a tutorial about this on the internet, and people loved it. But now I'm going to show you guys an even better way to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Macro. And by the way, if you're a ZBrush user and you haven't played around with macros, please do. It's super amazing. Macros. And I'm going to say Create Instance Subtool. What that will do, okay, what that will do is it will copy my subtool over. And this is going to be an instance of the original. Um, so basically, whatever I do to the original is going to happen to the instance. If I want to, I can go ahead and move the instance up. Put it in position of, I guess, a, a horn on the side here. I can duplicate it a bunch of times by clicking Control and drag, and then letting go and just kind of continuing as long as I would like the horn to be. This is really, really helpful. Basically, as you continue to pull up, it will measure the amount of distance from the original iteration and then just kind of multiply that by as much, many times as you need. I'm going to go to the gizmo. And in here, uh, we got the formers, which are really useful. They create like basic cages and things like that. I'm going to use the taper deformer. Oh, I should probably unmask. Come on, button. <laughs> button does not want to be clicked. And it's created kind of a, a cage around my model so that I can taper it as necessary. So I can grab these cones and just kind of drag them. I want the horn to be thinner on top and kind of wider on the bottom. I'm going to accept this. The reason I'm keeping it straight up and down, I think it's my hand that's touching the screen. There you go. So the reason I've kept this straight up and down is because the formers work better when they have kind of a single axis to attach to. So I'm going to go ahead and click it, if it'll let me. There we go. And I'm going to say Bend Curve. And this will create basically a curve that I can bend this model as. If I click this top little cone, if you hover over the cones, by the way, you can see what they do. It can be a little hard to get used to. If I hover over this, all right, if I go to the top cone, I can add as many points along the curve as I would like to. And the more points along the curve I add, the more detailed the curve will be. So I'm going to start really slow, kind of maybe add a couple more. Do a basic little horn. <laughs> Maybe actually have this one go into the head, like that. And when I'm done, I can accept. This is not where the magic happens. Where the magic happens is that all of these here are basically instances of the original. We are using something called Nano Mesh. If I go to the Subtool palette, and I go to Nano Mesh, where is it? Can anybody see it? <laughs> There it is. I can say Edit Mesh. And what it's going to do is it's going to open up the original right here, showcase it side by side. And anything I do to the original will happen to each instance, which means that I can detail this horn in like five seconds. First, I'm going to start by kind of smoothing out. Maybe I'll turn symmetry on for a second. Smoothing out the tops and bottoms, because I don't want it to look super, I guess, robotic. Then I'm going to kind of taper the bottom out, because I want them to stack more beautifully. So I'm going to reduce that. And maybe make it longer as well, because there were some gaps. Reduce it more. Check the horn to make sure that I'm not getting any weirdness. I think I'm a little bit up here still. I can fix that manually later, though. Then. Uh, the cool thing is that I can do whatever I want to this uh, model, and the instances will take it. I can paint it. I can dynamesh it. I can do whatever I want. I can go up in subdivisions. And you can see it's divided up on both. I really like to use this one brush called Blob. It does exactly what it sounds like. 
It just adds blobs to things and makes it more organic. So I can try to do that. Ooh. Clicking all the buttons over here. I think I'm going to try to get like one big blob down the center here. All around. Can you also use um, radial symmetry on here? So let me divide it up more. Turn it all black. So if I go to, um, where is it? Transform and activate symmetry. Turn on this R. I can turn on the radial counts. And I can, oop, that is totally the wrong axis. I can do a bunch of cool things to it, like detail it out as I'd like, and it will update the thing or, uh, um, automatically. And this is not something I could do straight on here because the radial symmetry at this point is totally out of whack, right? Because it's posed, it's rotated. So I could totally just do that if I'd like. Um, one really cool thing I can do is I can add spikes. If I take that same brush from the beginning, the snake hook brush, and I go to curve and turn on Occu curve, we can get like some really cool spikes going or something like that. Personally, I could do this for hours. <laughs> Basically, what AccuCurve does is it thins out the, the point of the curve, like that. That's pretty cool, actually. I like that. It looks very <laughs> ocean-y, like an urchin. All right. Once I'm done, let's pretend I'm done. I can go ahead and stop editing the nano mesh. Turn off edit mesh, that will automatically get rid of the split screen. But right now, I can't edit any of this because at the end of the day, all the nano mesh is is a bunch of planes with, this, with these meshes applied to those planes. So I can't really do much to it. Let me turn off that radial symmetry. Can't do anything really too much, too much to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, in the nano mesh, hit, where is it? Wait, I have to select the right one. Give me one second, guys. The button, it eludes me. It's too, too mesh. Maybe if I just skip this. <laughs> okay, one to mesh right there. And what that will do is it will actually create a normal mesh that I can actually sculpt on. One second, let that save. So if I grab this Dermian Sander, all of a sudden I can sculpt back on these. But you'll notice that there's also a plane right down the center. Excellent, I did that. So I'm going to go ahead and go to Subtool. Split on mass points. Oh. I'm gonna mask just the horns and separate it from the planes. Split on mass points. And then we'll notice that I have an extra subtool now, which is just a bunch of planes. This is how nano mesh works. It creates planes in the locations that you'd like them to and then kind of parents one of your mesh to each plane. The reason I like to keep these planes is that in the future if I wanna switch out all the meshes for my nano mesh, but keep the positioning I can do that. Part of why I love this workflow is that you can very easily change the, for example, let's say my client wants like ram horns instead that go around. I can very easily do that with just the same exact mesh from the beginning. I accidentally undid it, but it's there. <laughs> All right. So in order to get, get this horn on the other side, first I'm going to move it off the center a little bit. I'm going to mirror it because uh, whenever you mirror and weld, it likes using the whatever's on this side, not that side. So I'm going to go to deformation. Mirror, then geometry, modify topology, mirror and weld. And we have two horns. All right. Moving on. So another really cool thing that you can do to speed up your workflow is create your own brushes, which I think is an essential, essential part of ZBrush. Uh, in order to do so, there are so many easy tools to use. First, uh, we're going to talk about making alphas and then making VDMs. I don't know if you guys have tried a VDMs, but it's literally my favorite feature of all time. So let's say I want to create like tiny little 
scales or spikes or something. I'm going to just open up a new, uh, new subtool. I'm going to choose a sphere. I'm going to make polymesh 3D, which is a step you cannot forget. Divide it up a few times. When we're doing detailing, for example, it's very important to be in high res resolution. Otherwise, you will see those polygons, and it's just not very sightly, so to speak. Let me test to see if it's good. Yes, it is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create, um, I guess, scales using this brush called the extract, um, extractor brush. So I'm going to go ahead and mask out using the mask pen. Some scale shapes. Gonna invert that. Kind of just clean it up a little bit, make them interlock a little better. I also don't want too much space between them because of what I'm going to do next, which is deformation based. Once I have my mask cleaned up, I'm going to go to Deformation, which is another tab that you need to know if you want to make the most out of ZBrush. Basically, all this does is every single one of these sliders basically does almost like a, a global um, edit to the entire mesh. So if I say gravity, for example, everything that's, uh, that's not masked will receive the effect of gravity. So what I like to do is I like to put in a little bit of an inflate balloon. Ooh, that's way too much inflate balloon right there. And it will do it to everything and then a little bit of inflate. And then we can already have the start of what can be some scales. That is super fast. I'm going to take a little clay buildup just to make it more organic, just kind of sketch it around. Then a little bit of this trim dynamic brush, which basically flattens things out based on their normal. And just kind of clean it up, make it look more interesting. All right, let's say this is what I want to make my brush out of. I'm going to select the correct brush, which is the extractor brush. We have three extractor brushes. All of this, all the difference is basically the application of the brushes, whether or not we do drag rectangle, which is like just lets you drag it on. Let me show you that one first, because I like it. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to make this into an alpha that you can drag on. I'm going to go ahead and go in my history before I even started working on my um, scales and I'm going to get control and click on my history you'll notice that it's added a little white uh, marking to my history basically what this brush is going to do is once I've selected which area I want to turn into a brush it's going to take the area of history I've recorded and kind of compare it to now and see what the difference is and then it's going to turn that into a brush it's really freaking cool so I'm going to press G on my keyboard make this about the size I want the brush to be and then I'm going to select right in the middle. Oh, and click the wrong buttons. Woo. That was too fast. Let's try that again. Click right in the middle. Press G. Click and drag. Make sure that all of your changes are within the brush. Let it calculate. And you can see right here that the alpha has been created based on the scales I made. So I can apply it. You see that the edges are a little blurry. That's because of the focal shift of the brush. Basically, this is the fall off of the brush. If I do it like that, basically, we got like a perfect repetition. This will save you a lot of time on detailing. You can do pores. You can do really whatever you want. The other extractor brush option is the, the normal extractor. So what this one can do is you press down G, and you kind of just drag along. Let it go, and then you can just kind of do like this. You can just drag on your alphas. So if I were to try that out with my model, let's choose the right one. I can. The amount of time you spend on making your brush beautiful is going to pay off in the long run, so definitely spend more time than I have. <laughs> All right. So here's the thing, though. Let's say I don't like these. I have to take them off. 
my only option right now is to just smooth it and it's not going to look so good it normally looks blurry and annoying right i'm sure we've all had this issue i've seen a lot of portfolios come across uh, my desk with this particular issue on it so what i'm going to teach you now is to use layers when you're sculpting especially when you're detailing i'm going to go ahead and click on layers add a layer maybe i'll name it because you know that's a good idea scales and these layers work just kind of how, basically the same way that layers work in Photoshop. So everything that I do while this layer is in recording mode is going to be stored within that layer. So let's go ahead and try again. Let's do somewhere else. Let's say I put that down. Right. Looks beautiful, I know. And I send that to my clients. And my client's like, oh, I love everything you did except for those scales, right? And I'm going to be like, first, I'm going to cry. Just kidding. And then I'm going to try to smooth it away. Or if I was clever enough to create the layer, I can just go in here, stop recording, and click the eyeball. And everything that's recorded within the layer will disappear. The other benefits of the layer is that you can adjust intensity. So say your skills turned out too hard, you can turn them down. And you can even invert it. That's kind of cool, actually. I like that. All right. Other cool things you can do with layers is you can, for example, duplicate it if you want it to be more intense. Uh, and there's a lot of good tricks. When I use layers, I do it for certain situations. First is for design design options. If I'm not sure about a certain design element, I will use layers because that makes it easier to iterate so that I'm not locked in. When I, for example, add these scales or whatever it is that I'm doing, it doesn't have to be for detailing. I could, I could sculpt this whole thing with layers. Um, Another time is for posing, so that I can have the T-pose and the pose uh, in separate layers, so that I can easily tweak the two. Um, and when you're detailing, what makes this so powerful is that it can be used in combination. Let me add a few more scales. Gorgeous. It can be used with, in combination with ZBrush's morph target um, system. A morph target is just a, another way to say a blend shape. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and go hide my layer temporarily, go to where it says Morph Target, and I'm going to store a Morph Target. What this is going to do is it's going to store basically the location of every vertice in this mesh in the exact state that it is now. So this mesh is basically saved somewhere in memory. I can come in here, turn on my layer, record, and using the Morph Target brush, I can locally apply that morph target. So let's say, for example, right here. Do you see where the scales get a little messy? I don't like that. I'm going to make my brush smaller and apply my morph target just that area and kind of get rid of those scales. If I want, I can make it a little uh, harder as far as the brush goes and just kind of carefully get rid of those scales. This is not to be confused with smoothing. This is literally just removing everything that is within that layer, everything that's not in that morph target that I saved. This is very powerful because, for example, I can do it straight up here. And you'll notice that I didn't lose all the detail that was on the mesh underneath all of those scales. Super, super powerful workflow. All of my students and mentees always forget this. I'm like, are you using layers? And they're like, oh, I forgot. And I'm like, I want to kill you. All right. So use your layers. Next up, we have VDM brushes. So a lot of people know how to use alphas in throughout all 3D software, but VDM brushes are special because they are alphas that are extremely 3D, and they can let you do underhangs uh, of the alpha, so to speak. So let's go ahead and make one. I already have a plane right here. Let's check the topology. I'm going to go ahead and divide this up. When you're making VDMs, normally you have to start with a plane. I'm going to make a poly mesh 3D. Turn that off. I'm going to divide it up. But if I divide it up, you're going to see it's going to start to smooth. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn smooth off right here, sub, uh, subdivide smooth modifier, and divide it up a bunch of times so that you can kind of see what I'm doing. Let's see. That looks fine. So I'm going to create a spike for my creature, something that is repeatable, something that is has an underhang. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to mask out the center, maybe turn symmetry on for this one. Do the usual stuff that I like to do. So I'm going to go to deformation, um, 
inflate balloon, just kind of get a nice border, inflate again. Gonna take my snake hook brush with AccuCurve still there. Maybe look at it from the side and just try to create that spike look. <laughs> Move brush to just kind of flesh it out. I'm going to use this brush called Pinch that just kind of pinches things together. Get it to be somewhat spike like. Turn off my polyframe. Maybe I need to divide it up one more time. Maybe I can detail it out a little bit. If I had more time, I would do definitely do more. The key here is to leave the plane unchanged. If I do anything like this, it will also come out in my brush and kind of create some ugly artifacts that we don't like. So, all right, let's call it done. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to brush. I think I, think I did mess up the plane right here a little bit. If you ever do that, do not worry. You can just mask out that area. Invert that, and I'm going to go to deformation. I'm gonna save first. And then morph to grid. And what that will do is it will basically morph that area into a perfect grid. So I'm going to face, look at it straight from the front, go to brush chisel 3D. And basically this is a brush that already has all sorts of cool VDMs that I can like, apply. And you notice it's like an alpha, but it has like crazy 3D aspects to it. I'm going to look at it straight on and say from mesh, and that will just save my spike on the VDM. So what I can do, as I can come back to my little alien. And in a new layer, of course, I'm going to call this one Spikes. I can go ahead and start adding some spikes. This isn't changing the topology, it's just stretching it out. So you got to make sure that, one, your topology is ready, you're not doing it too low res or anything like that. Looks like I am getting a little artifact from just not fixing my plane up enough. Basically, you can do this. The best part of this is that the point of this presentation is to speed up your workflow. You can save all of these brushes out and use them again and again and again as many times as you need. All right, so it's super fast. Not to mention you can share it with your friends, sell it on marketplaces, things like that. I know artists that make thousands of dollars a month just selling like little spike brushes on different stores. So. Again, because I put it in a layer, I can change it depending on what I want. I can invert it. I can do anything I want. There are so many cool things you can do with these workflows. I already have the necklace on, but I'm going to show you guys how to do that. Another cool way to create your own brushes to uh, speed up your workflow is to use IMM brushes, insert mesh brushes. So let's get to it. I'm going to just make a new, new tool here. Select a sphere. I'm going to make PolyMesh 3D. Uh, panda cylinder. I almost did another sphere. OK. So now I have these two. And I'm going to create an insert mesh brush that uses these two to create kind of a beaded necklace that randomizes between the two. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go right here. I still already have my brush palette. So I'm going to go create and create insert multi mesh. If you hover over it, you'll notice that it says create insert multi mesh brush from all sub tools. These are sub tools right here. So it's going to automatically uh, have both of them in there. So I'm going to go ahead and say that. And we have a brand new brush and it has these two options. When I try to insert, I can select the two and just kind of insert stuff. People love using this for like booleans, for example. You can make mechanical parts and just insert, 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 and it will boolean it all together. But what I want is to create a necklace out of it. So I'm going to go to Stroke, Curve, uh, Modifiers. Let me find the Curve option. Curve mode. Now, when I insert it, I get a little curve that has my little bead on there. This can be very interesting to play around with. 
in order to randomize between the, do, the two, I'm going to go to uh, modifiers right here. I'm going to go and select variations, and I'm going to set it to two. I'm going to select the original one, variations two. And here we have, um, what does it say? multi mesh variation selectors. Zero is static, one is cycle forward, two is cycle backwards, and three is random. I like random, so let's do that. Let's test it out. If I actually zoom in, you'll notice that it's randomizing between them. So it's going to create like this like, nice little beaded necklace, pretty simple stuff. So let's find the right mesh again, the hardest part of this presentation. And I'm just going to, maybe I'll select the horns because they don't have um, poly groups. It's not snapping. Normally, it just snaps on its own. <laughs> but I can create my little necklace. There's a lot you can do with this. You can, for example, set it to weld itself. Yeah, I'm having some technical difficulties of it not sticking, but we can still make it work. OK, I'm going to just leave it like this. We're just going to all pretend that the necklace has a backside, OK? Right? We're all going to pretend that? Ah, just making it all worse now. There, perfection. I'll fix that later. And by knowing how to create your own brushes, you're going to basically unlock all sorts of tons of potential. There's a lot of things that look like they're really hard to make, but actually it's not. You're just using automated process or the same tools or kit bashing or things like that. Do I have enough time? All right, I have eight minutes to go, so I'm going to do the extra part of my presentation, which is basically some coloring tricks that you can use to color a little bit faster. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first bake all my layers. I'm going to color this creature out. I'm going to select the paintbrush, which is my favorite to use to color. I'm going to turn on no alpha for now. I'm just going to create kind of a base layer, maybe copy this paint over. By the way, you can copy colors by just hovering over it and pressing C on the keyboard, and you can kind of copy whatever you want. So I'm just going to kind of paint this thing in. Then select kind of a secondary color. Earlier I went with green, so I'll go with green again. I'm going to turn on alphas, and I'm going to turn on like one of these spotty alphas that help create the look of more organic skin. Making sure I have symmetry on. It's kind of secondary color. This is not the trick yet. This is just getting to it. Turn that off for more simplicity. OK. Gorgeous. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Girls <laughs> right here. OK. So the trick is to use auto masking to be able to easily select either cavities or high points in your model so that you can easily paint them in. So what I'm going to go is what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to uh, masking right here and you can see all these little um, options. You can mask by color, by ambient occlusion, by smoothness. I'm going to go ahead and choose peaks and valleys. Let's check it out. So it's not quite the perfect mesh or mask, but it does kind of already start highlighting the spikes, for example, if I want to paint them in. I'm going to turn the, the, the range here. Try again. Kind of just refine it until I get somewhere. I'm, I'm starting to get just the, spi the, the spots I had put on before. I'm going to invert that, maybe soften it, choose a slightly darker green or something, and just kind of paint those areas. Take that off to test, and you can see that we're just getting like kind of the spikes painted in. You can do, uh, if you want to fake, for example, having a little bit of blood flow or like a flush to the face, you can do mass by ambient occlusion. Wait for that to happen because it has to calculate ambient occlusion in the first place. Is it already on? 
You can kind of get like a more reddish tone. Invert it and just kind of place it like discreetly in those areas to kind of fake some flush. It's maybe too discreet. I don't know you guys can tell. It's starting to come in through here. Sometimes I just like to add a little bit of red to my models anyway, just to kind of make it feel more alive. I guess that's a pro tip too. A lot of people uh, fake this by just adding a little bit of a red light from underneath too when they're rendering. For the necklace, for example, I wanted to get like some sort of like worn, worn down bead effect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the base color for it, maybe like a blue. I'm going to go to color, fill object to kind of fill it all in, maybe a darker blue. Like that. I can mask by smoothness. Let's see what that looks like. So it's just going to mask like whatever's the smoothest, I guess. So I can, for example, paint that a different color if I'd like. Let me turn the intensity all the way up. Like that. So now all of my cylinders are different colors from the spheres. I can also um, mask by peaks and valleys. Invert that. Maybe choose a lighter color to make it look like it's worn off. Let's, start, let's see. It's starting to get somewhere. Like that. And we have... Uh, the painted necklace. I'm basically out of time, so I'm not going to go into the ex extra, extra presentation I had planned. But um, I would love to see. Oh, I forgot this part. Let's go ahead and do that. Hooray. Now I feel complete. So you can kind of do anything. FYI, you can also put colors on the layers. However, it can be a little tricky. The only real rule, I believe, that you have to follow when you're coloring with layers is that you have to make sure that you stop recording the layers before you bake them down. Otherwise, everything will turn black or splotchy. All right. I think that's it for me. Where's my time? Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Big round of applause for Anna Carolina. Now, where can people find you? Because you also stream and stuff too, right? Yeah. You're on uh, ZBrush Live. You're doing your own thing. Where can where can people find you? So I've been a ZBrush Live streamer for about four years now. So you can find me on the ZBrush Live uh, websites. We stream to YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. Uh, I stream uh, every other Saturday, sometimes in English, sometimes in Portuguese. I also have my own Twitch channel, Anna Carolina Arts. Uh, where I stream every Sunday, ZBrush. So if you ever have an extra question or anything like that and you miss me at the demo stations back there for the next hour, uh, feel free to stop by and ask me any questions you have. Right. So once again, we have... Oh, oh, here it is. Hold on. It's not, it's not a question? It is a question. Okay. Matt Millsted from MoGraph. Question. Okay, so the question was, when she was building out the horn, she was using cylinders. Is there a way to randomize the rotation of the cylinders as you move along? I believe so. I believe so. I don't remember exactly which slider you'd use for that, but I think it it's, should be pretty easy, especially when you're doing the deformer. I think so. So, yes. <laughs> so, yes, live but. audience takes precedent. I have several questions from the Internet, but you guys get priority. You've got priority seating. Internet's in the back. Sorry, Internet, but that's how it is. Questions for Anna? No. All right. So we're going to dive into Internet questions. You ready? Mm -hmm. Is Z-Remesher in ZBrush really quad remesher? What's quad remesher from? I don't know. Internet? It's not. The answer is it is not. So, all right. That was easy. Qu next one. All right. Do you lose quads when you manipulate your model in ZBrush? Um, you shouldn't lose quads, like, y unless you're actually running an operation that deletes quads or zero meshes, for example, everything should stay the same. We're just basically manipulating the location of vertices at the end of the day, or their color. So, no, you don't. 
<laughs> All right, uh, question for Anna. Did you study sculpting at Ringling? Or no. what did you study? Uh, what was your path? So I studied game art and design okay. um, in college, which was a little bit of everything as far as what it would take to make a game. Uh, then I don't study at Ringling because I teach there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I teach. <laughs> I teach. I um, teach. But I had done all of my learning on my own via basically YouTube videos, Z Classroom Online, FYI. It's by uh, its official ZBrush uh, Classroom Online. They will show you how to do literally everything. More stuff than I could probably learn in this lifetime. Wow. Um, somebody's wondering, are you using a stylus? And the answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Always never use a mouse for ZBrush. This, this stuff requires pressure sensitivity. So the mouse only has really on or off, right? right. Like, and so you, this has like 248, or at least that's the last time I bought one, which yeah, was like five be, years ago. Yeah, might be thousands uh, of levels. Yeah, so a bunch of levels of pressure that you can use. Somebody was wondering if you could go quickly over the key brush shortcuts you use, or at least the pop-up menus that let you move so quickly and adjust uh, brush size and all that. Of course. So first things first is the brush menu. So if you press down B, you'll get all of the brushes that you currently have loaded in your project. B for brush. B for brush. Then, you know, you don't really memorize all of these extra shortcuts, but the brushes are organized by name. So for example, if I want the move brush, I'll press M on my keyboard, and that will highlight all of the M, the brushes that start with the letter M. Then I can either find it or the ones I use the most, I'll memorize it. So I know that move is MV for move. So it's very intuitive, so I'll just press V, and there I have the move brush. So whenever I move, I'm, I'm flying through this. I'm just literally basically typing in the initials of the brush. So brush for brush menu, then like clay buildup is CB, like that. For the brush options itself, you the hold down space. I missed the space key <laughs> just now. You hold down space, and you get the extra options for the brush. So we got draw size, which makes the brush bigger or smaller. Focal shift, which basically changes the fall off of the brush. So basically, the brush becomes harder if, in like Photoshop terms if I turn the fall off to negative 100 are really soft if I turn it to 100 positive. The Z intensity, maybe I should grab some brushes to show this off. So the Z intensity affects how much it actually affects the mesh. So if I turn it to 100, it becomes a little stronger. If I turn it down to zero, it doesn't do anything. The RGB intensity, if I turn it to RGB mode, is how much color we're going to get. So if I change the color here, let me go ahead and fill it with whites, color fill object. So if I set it to 80, it's pretty strong. If I set it to 4, it's pretty weak. You can barely just see that. Then we have the alphas, which is basically the shape with which the, the brush is applied. So let me turn the RGB intensity like that. And we have... Kind of like the, I don't know if we should get into all this, <laughs> but we have the way the brush is applied. So basically you got freehand, which lets you like freehand it. Woo! You got drag rectangle, which basically just lets you drag in one time. Kind of like how I showed earlier, like that. You got spray, which sprays it around. Woo! That looks nice actually, right? Little bush. <laughs> nice environment. <laughs> environment art piece here. And so a few others. So mostly like B for brush, mm -hmm. space bar for the brush settings and color. And those are the main two. Yeah. Just like Keep that. Keep it simple. There you go, internet. All right, let's see here. Um, does the morph brush work in mirror mode as well? So can you yes. use? So the answer is yes. All right. Um, can you dynamically place the necklace so it lays naturally? Yes. I don't know why it didn't work this time around. When I was doing my demo at home, it worked just fine. So, so yes, there is. Yeah, I think you just have to dynamics. turn on. There's a snapping setting somewhere in here in the stroke, in the stroke pan panel. So you, it's probably that right there. Snap. It'll snap to whatever you, it's touching. All the vertices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, so after you create a model, do you rig it in ZBrush or do you export it? And then uh, set it up in C4D or rigging? And if so, uh, materials, do they come over with the model? So uh, you won't necessarily rig in ZBrush. You can do some like quick posing in ZBrush, but it's not really the right tool for that. So you'd rig it somewhere else. As far as materials, I'm not sure about the Cinema 4D workflow because I'm more in the game world. But uh, you would have to UV it in the game world and then export the different maps. 
Okay. I'm not sure if there's like a plugin or something that would work for Cinema 4D. Yeah. Uh, well, we just we just teamed up, so I'm sure we're gonna yeah. figure that out. But uh, feature request, Jessica, question. Yeah. All right. So that's a great question. So the question is, when you're painting with color, does it also paint on the other channels like displacement or normal or any of that? So ZBrush, I, as far as I know, doesn't really do PBR like that. But there are materials that you can apply at the same time. So like if you have a material, um, you've got basically matte caps that do different things. So for example, again, do like gold, for example. You can edit the materials up here to change you know, their specularity and whatnot. Um, and then you can paint with it, of course. Uh, I just wouldn't say that that's one of the main features of ZBrush as of now. Okay. Awesome. And I think Paul went over it before that you can still export your normals in those other channels. So I guess apply the texture and play with it. Or hang out in the back and try some uh, export because you'll yeah. be around for another hour. You can definitely do that. If you bake the maps out, you can okay. export them. Yeah. yeah. So then you can bake. Easy bake. That's how, that's how we do it here. <laughs> Awesome. So that was it from the internet. And thank you, everyone, for participating. Anna will be in the back for another hour for any questions. So if you wanted to dive in and go over any of her amazing artwork or techniques, she'll be available. And she'll be also be joining us again tomorrow. So you'll be able to ask some more then. Stay tuned. We're up with one of my favorite people, John Jack. So stay tuned. We'll be right back in just a few moments. And we'll see you at, after the break. So see you then. You need